<laughs> How do you maintain your happiness? Well, again, if it's a, you know, if it's a pleasurable sensation, to maintain it, it leads to exhaustion. You have to go again and again, put on triggers and and sensations, and then then you cannot maintain it because the, it's like a can candle that burns itself. There's a fatigue element in the enjoyment of pleasure. At some point, you cannot maintain. If you want to go further and you know, and make it uh, arise artificially, say like people who use I don't know ecstasy or whatever. The problem here is that you are momentarily maintaining it, but you are, from neuroscience point of view, again building up another circuit which is different than enjoyment, which is wanting, and it's very tricky because it's a different network in the brain. So you build up the wanting because it's pleasurable. At some point, there's an exhaustion of the pleasurable aspect, but the wanting has been built up. So you want something that doesn't bring you any more satisfaction. That's why you are hooked. So maintaining happiness is, so unlike pleasure, the more you experience happiness as a way of being, the more it gets deeper, stronger, because it has to do also with wisdom, it has to do with training, so, and therefore, you not only sustain it, but you actually keep on cultivating it as a skill. And then you are more and more able to have the resources to deal with the ups and downs of life. So you not only sustain it, you actually enhance it through training. Mm -hmm. Because you are training, not pleasure, but you are training kindness, uh, in, you know, freedom from all the wandering thoughts, and all those skills that actually makes you deal with everything in a much more sort of uh, balanced way. Um, can I ask, presumably you still have uh, cravings for things like, like money Mostly or... Mostly or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how do you... Avocados. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> how do you overcome the sort of more uh, destructive cravings that you might have? Well, that's a good point, of course. I mean, to have inclination for things in itself may not necessarily be too wrong. If, if it doesn't become craving, yeah. but to enjoy something, it's, again, it's the distinction between um, a nice hot shower and mm -hmm. craving, yeah. which is become with thirst. And thirst is a good example in Buddhist literature. It's like craving is like drinking salty water. The more you drink, the more you are thirsty. So this is a vicious circle. So why do you have understood that? And they say, no, should I be addicted to the cause of suffering or not? So mm -hmm. then the wisdom aspect comes into perspective. You know, what is really good for my life? Yes? Yeah. Why should you do things that are just repeatedly bringing you suffering? This is kind of silly. Yeah. So now the concept of so-called renunciation, that is very, first it's a wrong translation. Uh, renunciation is not about giving up what's really good in life. I mean, what I mean really good is not what we might think is really good, but what's actually bringing happiness. That would be absurd. But renouncing the cause of suffering, that's what we want. Yeah. So now, then wisdom has, has to come in what is truly contributing to my flourishing in life. That's what I should pursue. And all the other things, why should I bother? So that's the distinguish, making a hierarchy and distinguishing. Yeah. That's the first step. Then you just you know sort things out. Okay. So that's the point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, did you realize at some point you were officially happy? I don't know. You know, when I was a teenager, it didn't mean much. You know, happiness. You know, we didn't think. We don't think in, the, in those terms. Now we do experience. You know, joy, sadness. You know, melancholy and all that stuff. But. We don't sit and they oh, I'm happy or not, how much, you know, and all this, all this thing. I don't think so, isn't it? So, and then, um, I think it's more when you start thinking, you know, what do, what do we really want in, in life? What? Then you start to recognize this notion of things that contribute to some kind of well-being and something that repeatedly makes you miserable. So you get a, some idea that there is a kind of, two ways of experiencing things, an unsatisfactory one and a deeply satisfying one. 
Well, then the, you can start you know, conceptualizing that and thinking of happiness, suffering, and so on. If you, because thinking about that and clarifying those concepts is helpful. If you know where you are going, then you, you, you will be better guided as to how to accomplish that. You know, if you aim at a target shooting an arrow, if you don't see the target and if you blindfold, and you might hit sometime, but you don't even know why. But if you investigate the mechanism of happiness and suffering, then you get more interest in what constitutes happiness, what constitutes suffering. So then you start thinking more in those terms. But I think when we are younger, we just more like feel those things and then experience that and say, oh, no, just this, this thing didn't feel right, or I feel very good when I do that. But maybe we don't, in a way, it's not, not, nothing wrong with not conceptualizing. But I think when we realize that there possibly there's ways to enhance that through skills and cultivation, then we need to have a clearer idea of distinguishing pleasure from happiness, what brings misery, what brings happiness. It's not just a philosophical and you know, conceptual pursuit because it translates into what you are going to experience.